did some research on shame and I came up with three things that I think shame a person. One, one was, or one was to not, let me say it this way. One was to deny what a person's experience is. That's not true. That didn't happen. That abuse didn't happen. You're not really like that, whatever. I deny it, dismiss it. I make it not a big deal. I'm going through this quickly. There's a lot of material I can offer you about this that I have online. And you won't need to know that much about it for the rest of the talk, but I want to frame that for you. Denial, dismissal, and then pathologizing or gaslighting or blaming. People use different words for that. I think something's wrong with you for being that way. And then I learned that this believing tended to counter the shame. And I learned two other things counter the shame. One thing I called respect. The word respect comes from the word spect, the Latin for spect, like spectacle. It's to see, to look at. And re is to do it again. To respect is to look and look again. I want to look at your feet. I want to look at the walk. Can you show me that? Can you show me how they would do that? Can I look again? Can you do more of that so I can see more of that? Can I look at that? Keep looking at something. It counters shame because now I'm inquiring about your experience and you have the sense when I do that, that I'm interested in. I'm not thinking something's wrong with you. I'm fascinated, moved by, loving of, compassionate towards. So I, the respect and the second thing I called relating which is I can relate, I can feel, I have tears, I have compassion, I'm moved by. So I found that these three qualities, believing, I sometimes call it radical believing, respecting, radical believing, respecting, and relating. I thought counter shame. Now, that's a lot to say. I'm going to put that in context. I know I could have done a whole two hours just on that in the research. Hang with that if you can. I know I'm asking a lot. Why is that important for this topic? Okay. I want to tell you something about abuse. When a person, here's a person, let's imagine they're a child, but they could be an adult. It could be a woman. It could be a black person. It could be a Jewish person. It could be a German person. It could be an adult in a certain, set, in a certain setting or in a classroom. Here's a person. Let's imagine for now it's a child. And let's imagine that person gets assaulted. That's a hit. That could be a physical hit, a sexual assault, a word, a look, a neglect, a blindness. I'm, I, I'm not going to see you, an unwillingness to hear you. There's many different kinds of things that assault. Okay? This person gets assaulted by this person. This person has more power than this one. Bang. I hit this person. Now what happens next? What, makes, what brings healing to that event? What allows that, what makes that event a lifetime difficulty or many years difficulty or not a lifetime difficulty? And what makes, that a more, what makes that a healing moment, what makes that a healing when we look at it 10 years later, 20 years later, 200 years later, is if we look at it without shame. If we look at it without shame, we respect it. Tell me what happened. I want to see. What did you do? What happened in your body? Did you dissociate? Go ahead and dissociate. Slowing down. What did it feel like? Where was that person? When did that happen? Respect, relate. I can connect with that. I can feel that. My body and emotions are moved by you. And that person says, wow, that person is moved by me. I matter. Something is, I'm important. Respect. And I believe you. Something's inside of you. Let's talk about what happened. Let me follow you, care for you, see what's inside of you. Believe in your dissociations, believes in your, in your angers, believe in your sadnesses, all those things, believe in that. When those things happen, then the healing problem starts unfolding and taking care of itself. But, and I'm calling that a witness, can you follow? That's a witness, a healing witness, a loving witness, I sometimes call it, a non-shaming witness. But if I say, oh, that's no big deal, I don't think that really happened. You're making too much of that. Maybe you're too sensitive. If I deny, it didn't really happen. Dismiss, it's not that big a deal. It didn't happen that way. You should let go of it. Blame you. It's, you're doing that because you're sensitive. That you're doing that because you can't let go of things. You're doing that because you're unforgiving. If I do all those things, then the person, in addition to this assault, internalizes a view of themselves. And they no longer think, 
I'm a hurt person. And they no longer come to you as a therapist saying, I got injured. They come to you saying, what's wrong with me? How come I'm like this? How come I do drugs? How come I'm so this way? How come I can't sleep? Why am I so sensitive? How come I have the same patterns over and over? What is wrong with me? They don't say, here's what's happened in my life. They speak about, they speak from this internalized view. This view, you're screwed up. That didn't happen. I don't know why you're even thinking that. You're making a big deal about that. Why are you acting that way? That view enters the psyche so deeply. If the assault is heavy, it's a deep cut. That view goes in so deeply that the person now sees themselves through these eyes. And they present themselves through these eyes. And they come to us as therapists through these eyes. They say, how come I can never deal with, how come I'm still angry with this person? Can you hear my framework? I don't say, let's explore my anger. Let's find out what it's there. Let's find if anything else is there. I don't say that. I say, how come I'm this way? How come I'm such a screwed up human being? That's shame's viewpoint. That's not my experience. That's shame's viewpoint. It's very important to the body issue because people come with that. Okay. Why is that important to this issue before I go into the case studies? Because people, in this case, we're focusing on women, the women's body, the women's psyche, have an assault. Remember I said 97% of women have violent voices inside, coming from external areas all over the place, objectifications, etc. All these things are happening. There's assaults happening all around, whether that's the media's view, whether that's inside ideas, whether that's a parent who says I'm disgusting, all the different possibilities, it's an assault. And then the question is, how are we going to witness that assault? Okay, think of it this way. Let's say I'm a woman and you're my, all my therapists. And I come to you and I say, dear therapist, dear coach, dear healer, can you help me lose weight? I really want to lose weight. It's really hard for me to lose weight. Can you help me? Now think, what would you do? What would your answer be? Think to yourself, how would you respond to that woman? Can you help me? I really want to lose weight. I've tried to do this for years or weeks or decades, and I'm never successful. Can you help me? What would you do? How would you respond? Know that for yourself. Because that person is not speaking of a bodily experience. That person is speaking, is speaking from an opinion about their body that is not separate from shame, that's not separate from the internalized voices and oppression. In fact, it's not separate from what we call inner criticism. Because every day I go to the mirror or I go to get dressed or I go out to a group and something inside me and outside me says, look at you. Look at your body. Look at how it is. Look at how unattractive it is. Look at those pants you're wearing. You shouldn't be wearing those clothes. You should be doing this. How come you ate ice cream yesterday? There's a constant assault going on in that area. And that assault, think about this, and that assault, you're this, you're that, you're no good, you're terrible, you're, you're not, you're, you're, I don't even want to say all the words because they'll trigger too much. You know all the words. You're disgusting, you're this, you're that. They're contemptuous words, they're not benign. They're fierce, assaultive words and attitudes. That happens over and over and over. Then this person comes to you and says, can you help me lose weight? But they're coming, not only because of a health issue, very, sometimes yes, but not only, very rarely only. They're coming because this figure, this part of the culture that's internal, this part of the person, is beating on them so much as go do something about this. You're a screwed up, disgusting creature. Do something about that. Then they come to therapy, you see, motivated by this. You would say, but I would feel better if I lost weight. Part of, and I would learn part of the reason you're gonna feel better is because you're hoping that this is gonna be less. Does that make sense? 
You're hoping that this is going to go away. You're hoping that I'll be thinner and I'll be healthier. And I'm also hoping that this will go away. And if you don't spend time understanding what that inner dynamic is about, what that inner criticism is about, what that internalized sexism is about, and you go along with her agenda, independent of this, you are then complicit. You're saying, in a way you're saying, sure, I agree with your opinion about yourself, I'll help you. You're not trying to do that. I'm not saying you or I are ill-willed. We're not bad intentioned. Does that make sense? But we're going along. We're complicit. We're now sided with this critic saying, yeah, I'll help you. And, and what we're not saying, but the message goes in is, well, I'll help you because it's really true all those things about you. You really should change those things about yourself. It's a very critical thing for us as therapists. How do we not get in complicit? And the way to not be complicit is to begin by talking about, why are you coming? What's so bad about being heavy? I know that. Tell me more about what's going on. Tell me your stories. I want to know something about that environment that lives inside of you so that I am not accidentally, unconsciously part of an inner criticism. I, as a man, am not sided with a patriarchal gaze that's assaultive. I want to be a healing, not a shaming gaze. I don't want to think greed that something is wrong with you. I want to think fascinating. You're eating this? Fascinating. Your body looks like this? Fascinating. You're, you go to eat steaks and potatoes in the middle of the night? I want to find out what's intelligent that's moving in that person. The opposite of what's wrong, I want to find out what's really going on. What kind of beauty is that person expressing in the very way they're living, just like Sandy? What kind of intelligence is that person expressing? What kind of spiritual autonomy and sovereignty is that person expressing? Just like Sandy. She spun. We said, wow. So I have to, to me, to be a non-shaming witness, I have to say, I wonder what that person is up to. It doesn't mean I can't help a person lose weight, but I can't begin, in my view, other people will be different. In my view, I can't begin by being complicit in an unconscious view that you're a screwed up, unattractive, non-intelligent, undisciplined human being. And research says it doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Because here's the person, and here's the reason for they're gonna go get a diet. You know you're a disgusting, terrible human being. Here's now they're gonna go for the weight loss program. And what's gonna happen when that person starts feeling better about themselves and more self-loving? You know what they say to this original criticism? Screw you, who needs that around? Get the hell out of here. And then what happens? The motivation goes away because I was motivated a lot by this criticism. And then I go right back to my same strategy. That's a very fundamental understanding. It's almost never talked about. People call that yo-yo dieting. I do this thing to make myself feel better. I feel better. And I say, let's attack that damn sexist, inner critical, self-hating thing that's making me go to a weight loss program. Can you follow that? The, par the, part, of the, the part of the person that resists the diet is the most self-loving part of the person most of the time. People think, no, that's the stupid part of me. That's the bad part of me. That's the derailing part of me. I'm saying the opposite. I'm going to show you stories, that hopefully, about that. Okay, I'm going to do an exercise in a moment. Does anybody, thank you for everybody for hanging in with that much. That's a lot of theory and understanding. I know that's a lot of framing of an issue, but I want your intellect to frame an understanding that deepens your vision. And then we'll do some learning via exercise and we'll do learning through the case studies and modeling. I wanted you to get that. Let's see.